to Forge the Narrative. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. I'm joined tonight by Adam Camilleri. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Camilleri. And Red Powell. Good evening. We are the Bella Law Souls Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. 40K is being rocked to the core. Mm. To its very foundations. Did you see that that hook, that clickbaity title that I just <laughs> worked into the first couple of minutes of the conversation? <laughs> very well put. Yeah, quality so, content. Yeah, so today, I mean, by the time you're hearing this, it'll be a little bit later than this. But today, we got a a, a big reveal into how core units and characters are going to work going forward in new codexes. And, you know, as you know, we talked a fair amount on the last episode of like about real world things. And we were talking about, you know, how tanks don't flip over when they go boom. That's not <laughs> red. That's not what you said. But that was that's what oh, I, that was my takeaway. That was my only takeaway, too. Oh, <laughs> mm, good. Very good. Uh, you know, in, in this week, the characters will only buff things with the keyword core. Or let me say that, that the characters that we know about right now, the ones they talked about. Because I, I was I was driving today and I was thinking about, well, what about tech marines not being able to do something to vehicles? I'm like, well, dummy, mm-hmm. they're going to have another rule that, that says what they do to vehicles or whatever. Yeah. But uh, the alteration to things like the lieutenants and the captains being able to have their aura effects affect core things is different than what we have right now and it's a pretty significant change i think it's huge and i'm i'm i'll say this from the at the outset i'm a fan i know how you guys feel but i'm a fan of this i'm with you adam i i think that you know so when you look at it it's it's how the ability is written you're you're exactly right paul in that that some of these abilities you know it's it's exactly what they say and understanding that there's going to be you know so if you take space marines for example and they've had a lot of synergy across the entire army it's going to be instead you know it's more focused on at least to certain degrees, there's going to be synergy within the core. You're going to be able to build a lot of your synergy better between core units and between mm-hmm. abilities that have the that can affect core units. But you know, then so like, I mean, the captain or whatever, he you know, he might not be a core unit, so then he's not going to, as the article stated. So I, I I think it's a good balancing effect. I think that it definitely is going to shift the game, and I think the way that they're kind of intending it to be played as the designers. Well, when we well, had the the first. I guess character FAQ is like do characters buff themselves and and I got the impression maybe now seeing this that um that maybe when they were writing the FAQs they were like well I guess that's what it says you mm, know yeah but but <laughs> or, or I guess you know what what it really means was yes uh, obviously a model is within range of itself and so when yeah. something says it does this two models then I guess by proxy then they, that that is the case, but maybe that wasn't what they set out to do, or maybe things have just evolved since then, and here we are. Mm. Mm-hmm. So here's my analogy for it. I, I need an analogy for anything. That's just how my brain works. But you know, you have um, there are different types of businesses, and some businesses where everybody works with everybody, um, and then there are some businesses that are what they call siloed. And my business, the, the what I work in, and my my job is siloed. I work in a department that only works with others in my department, and there are other departments, and they only work with people in their departments, and they answer to the heads of their departments and stuff. And so, when you have a space marine captain, space marine captain works in his silo of core units, and then you, you're probably going to have a tech marine which works in his silo of armored units, and an apothecary which works in his silo of infantry units or whatever. Um, so this is real fundamental breakdown, which sounds a lot like what the codex you know codex space marines feels like and is when you feel like when gilliman was sitting down writing the codex he was all like and then the captain buffs the repulsor um and he's like 20 inches away from the infantry (laughs) you know that's not how he envisioned it working i feel like this is a lot more reflective of the fluff on top of it being a really interesting way of crafting your armies now and it's good i think there's going to be a fundamental shift in the way we value things um, I don't know if this is speculating on what's going to be carried forward in the new codex, but they've already allu- alluded to the fact that chaplains are going to be carried forward in the new the super chaplain from um, Faith in Fury. Master of be, Sanctity. Yeah, with yeah he's going to be carried forward. So we, we could assume that things like the tech marine are going to be carried forward. Now, all of a sudden, the captain makes no difference to those those gun lines. He makes very minimal difference. But that tech marine is tripled in value because he's like one of the only applicable buffs you can place on your artillery, your thunder fires, your whirlwinds, your uh, executioners, your new land speeders and pre- um, predator equivalent tanks. Um, so we could see a fundamental revaluing in, in the way we construct lists, which I'm, I'm really excited for. I think this is a great change. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it it does mention in the article that this is not just troops. So it's not just things from the troop you, section of mm. your stuff. This is, I yeah. mean, they, they call out specifically the heavy intercessors, which is cool, by the way. Ten man squad of heavy intercessors. Oof. Mm-hmm. Oof. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know, we, one of my things is I look for in value when you're, when you're going down and trying to find out what the best value choice for your army is. It's like, how big is this squad and how much oomph could I get out of a stratagem to burn mm-hmm. on this thing? And, you know, 10 man things with big guns, you know, you got, you have to look at that, but yeah. that's what they use as the example. Say it's not just troops that they're talking about. They can be in the quote unquote core. So mm-hmm. I would, I would, I'm interested to see how much, how much specialization they put into this. Like, is it going to, ch- is the, what is core for dark angels going to be different from what is core for blood angels and space wars is what is core for Ultramarines going to be different from what is core for Raven guard. Um, I'll be. I'm, I'm really interested to how how much nuance and how much depth they go with this. I would like, I, I, and that is what I would like to see. I would like to see them mix it up for different different factions, different things. I'd like to see Death Company and Sangard maybe well, be. I mean, maybe maybe not Sangard. This yeah. does say. I mean, I'm going to read verbatim. In the case of the first two books, Codex Space Marines and Codex Necrons, many elite units such as Terminator squads and Lich Guard, as well as fast attack units like Bike Squads and Tomb Blades, have the core keyword. Mm. Even some vehicles will be core units too, where appropriate. Well, you're thinking that. Well, my first instinct there is things like rhinos, things like impulses, um, drop pods, maybe for some armies might get the core rule, which I think is exciting as well. Um, you know, I, I do hope repulsor execution is. Well, they already told us that repulsor execution it doesn't, but I do hope things of that ilk don't end up being like your heavy heavies fire support backline. You know, I'm bru- not, I don't bruiser. know about rhinos. But like dreadnoughts, that'd be sick. Bunch of stompy it's coming up the battlefield, getting the benefit of a of a captain running in behind him or a chaplain or something. That's mm. I, I'm excited. It, it, but, but, see, have, but is it realistic? Like as we you know we were talking about tanks and can't a captain be organizing and and buff? I mean, yeah, I, but see, it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to have a real world. Uh, you know an, what is it? Uh, correlation. Yeah, it just well, has sure. to make sense rules wise. Yeah, and so that's that's I mean, really it is it is a game mechanic, right? And again, we go back to uh George E. P. Box said, uh all models are wrong. Some are just more useful than others, right? And so like you can find something wrong with every abstraction that if you want to in regards of uh, a mechanic that's emulating something real right because mm. that's the whole point it's an abstraction it's going to take something away and in doing so it immediately it's not reality and therefore it, it invalidates itself to certain regards right and so we as players we buy into this and we ex- have to accept certain degrees of abstractions so when it comes mm-hmm. down to it in the core element i mean would you like you know to have the ability to be able to coordinate and give orders to every single aspect to perfect coordination which is what we can say prior to this introduction of the core and everything else like that would be yeah sure you would like everybody appreciated it those that had the advantage definitely played into it they're adding in an abstraction where okay only the core are going to benefit from it and they've given some some reasons to that and you can dispute it you know to whatever extent that you want to, but I mean, it's kind of like when we go back to the, 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 the seizing mechanic, right? We talked about that a, a little while ago when they, they got rid of the seizing mechanic, right? Um, do in reality, can the enemy seize on you? Can they actually seize the initiative? Yeah, they absolutely can. However, when it comes to the gameplay that we have, um, I think the the greater majority has agreed that they didn't like that that 16%. And I think that that Games Workshop being the you know game company, the model making company that it is, understood that it was something like that. And so they kind of, you know, they let that mechanic fall to the wayside. Mm. Um, and, and that's okay. Like it's, again, it's a war game. It's not war. And so yeah. it's okay to accept some abstractions. And there are reasons to it. You just got to buy into it. And if you mm. don't, I mean... Uh, I think it's still going to happen. <laughs> you make a good point about us making a different value assessment of things because of this when we're building our list. And, you know, in this picture, like in the article, it shows two captains, like a blade guard captain or whatever. And then the guy with storm shield plasma pistol. And then right behind him is the banner guy. Mm-hmm. Like, do we think the banners are maybe affect all models? So that like, you, know, oh, you yeah. have these layers of, of, of buff things. So, 
you know, company standard buffs everybody. He buffs mm-hmm. the captains. The captains then buff the core or whatever. And I don't know. Sounds good to me if that's if it works out that <laughs> way. That does sound pretty good. Uh, crazy, crazy thought. So right now we have a lot of different mechanics built into the game. What if Psychic Awakening has been a, a test bed for different mechanics? Things of the ilk of pivotal roles, say what Harlequins did, where they can they have an aura and they can pay to exchange that aura for another aura. What if that's something that's being applied wholesale? And say at the start of the game, instead of buying Chapter Master, you can pay two CP and his uh, real ones aura no longer. He, he instead of becoming captain becomes a, a brigadier, and his his aura no longer affects core. It affects uh, artillery keyword. It affects heavy support keyword. It, oh, it affects. You're probably on something. Keyword. I mean, as far as what, like, what, psychic awakening being a test, yeah, bit, I think you're exactly yeah. Right. What if what if all these mechanics, these different little dribbling and different little trial things, like um, replacing your essentially replacing smite for Eldar as a you know Eldar got to replace their smite with a different power um, and you can swap it out, or the Exarch powers and things like that. What if these are all being a test bed for a bunch of different mechanics and see which ones uh, fall flat on their face, fall flat on their face, and which ones have legitimate merit? Um, that would be really exciting. You're definitely onto something. I mean, I think that any time that you the game like a game designer releases a restriction like no one can do this well then mm-hmm. when with as much variance as we have in the game like the the neck the one guy who can do that then becomes spicy and that's something that you yeah. can throw in there and i, I like the, the g-dubs so my f- my hope and fear at the same time was that when we get the space marine codex um and this is you know still to be heard but um it sounds like this the way they're going is that they weren't gonna um so much as change the mechanics of of marines and uh, adjust them to kind of level them out, I guess. Because I think there's almost an accepted perception that they are too strong. They've got too much juice in the tank. Um, but I was I was fearful of them removing things wholesale because I feel like it 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 does just create a feel bad moment. Oh. I had some stuff and it has been removed. This is a much more elegant way of doing it. You still have all the same buffs, but we're just creating some parameters of, upon which you can use them. I feel like, this, and this goes into what Red said, they're creating a construct within the game rather than taking things and giving things uh, willy-nilly. They're just t- taking things that were already strong and just putting some new ones into them, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Maybe we'll get rules for all the different primary as lieutenants. Like <laughs> if you take the one post this way, he buffs these units. If you take the one post that way... He buffs. Oh, we need we need the eight. We still need the eight. You know how the eight for Tau? We need the eight for <laughs> for lieutenants. If you take eight primary lieutenants, they all buff each other in a different way. And like you know, super plasma pistols and oh boy, super chain swords. Enjoy. You'd have to bump them up to like <laughs> sixteen or something. I don't. I think I yeah, think we're would. we're there's, more than yeah, primary lieutenants. <laughs> But I mean, this look, is a very yeah. this is a very carrot or stick moment. We're getting the they're giving us the carrot. They they really put the stick away on this one, haven't they? Uh, it's, I mean, I, I think some people are going to feel the exact opposite. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, fair. I think that some people are going to be like, man, you know, I, I really my army has to function this way. Like it needs, I need this to work on my thunderfires or whatever. And it, the, if it doesn't, then my you know my experience is is impacted, shattered. Mm, so yeah. Yeah, uh, well, and I, I was talking to someone else about that. that you know, I mean, there's a lot of chatter out there, right? There is a lot mm-hmm. of discussion about this right now. And for sure, I, I think this is definitely, a, if we saw some deviation, you know, some people felt like the shift from 8th to 9th, um, maybe with Psychic Awakening, maybe it felt a little more gradual than it did of more of like a, you know, a, a straight shift between 8th mm-hmm. and 9th. I, I really think that as they do this and we see the first ninth edition codexes, I really think we're seeing the significant distance between 8th and ninth at this point. I think it's enough of a shift that people have to, it's no longer just the terrain and, mm-hmm. and the setup and everything. It, it's also now these changes in the units and the very... <laughs> core of the the codexes and whatnot mm. that, i know you tried to resist saying that I, just I, then, I, but... I, I did i really did it's all right. um <laughs> but uh no I, I really do think we're seeing ninth edition more so than we were anything of eighth edition mm. at this point well i mean we all said that didn't we there was a very hard reset from seventh to eighth and it took us a good us uh, probably nine months before we got the vision of what g dub even wanted um eighth edition to look like like it was only until we got like a, a good third of the codexes out that we realized, oh yeah, everyone's going to get a minimum of two pages of stratagem. Some are going to get four for some reason, and others are going to get two. But um, you know, uh, you know, they're all going to get a decent amount of buffing characters. That are gonna, everyone's going to have an aura. Everyone's going to have stratagems. Everyone's going to have stratagems to get more wall of traits. Stratagems to get more relics. Everyone's going to yeah. You're going. We had a real 
real sense of the structure of the gameplay as well as for how the missions were progressing as well where they they did have that divide between end of game and progressive and now we've got a vision for the we've got a vision for the uh, the missions we've got a vision for the tables we're just waiting for the visions of the factions now and i feel like you're absolutely right Brad. we're starting to get a little bit of an inkling of how g-dub intends for things to be played and to me it's feeling a lot more like fifth edition than it is about than it is eighth edition from the way things are going remember in remember in uh fifth edition we started having really, really siloed armies oh if you took uh war boss on bike you got bikers and knobs on bikers as core or as troops i love this that. case i did i did really like that it does it's we're not it doesn't feel like we're going straight back to that i'm not sure I, we, we want to go straight back to that but i would like more of that than what we had in eighth if that's if that makes sense that's no it does yeah that makes sense yeah since we're i mean we're, we are just spitballing here like there's no we're just making some assumptions and leaps of consciousness kind of things uh do you since we know that there's going to be like a wholesale uh edit of codexes that have these like flamers and heavy flamers and that kind of stuff do you think they'll go in and, and sprinkle in some uh core and these types of rules in in other codexes Coming just right out of the gate after this mechanic goes live for the Marines and Necrons? Hmm. I think it's going to be tough because, uh, you know, and I was thinking about this too in, in regards of the the shift and adjustment. You introduce this core aspect. I was kind of, so I don't know if you guys saw it. I mean, they, they you know, in their, the Warhammer community articles, you know, they've been slowly but surely dropping this or that or whatnot. And Indomitus, so we saw the shift with some of the characters in that, you know, so for example, Space Marines, uh, it wasn't a huge deal, but litanies being done at the beginning of the command phase versus the beginning of the turn or the round. Mm -hmm. And then with the Necrons, you saw a, a shift in my will be done where now you're there, there was more of, you know, it used to be my will be done was pick a unit and then they kind of split it with the new Necron overlord where some of it is an aura and some of it is selected unit. And so um, uh, what I was interested to see was if they were going to do more of that. And we kind of saw that in this article today in regards of, okay, well this core, you know, these core units are going to get it. Now, are you, are we going to have kind of a, a gap? Now we, we saw in the preview, right. And, and you, you guys the, the other day mentioned some of the stuff when we talk about, I mean, blood angels, Space Wolves, um, Death Guard, and Death Watch Death are Watch, all yeah. getting their deal, right? Mm -hmm. And and so that's that's three of the Space Marines on top of the Space Marine Codex, and then along with Death Guard, are the are the Death Guard going to have the right end that change the abilities? How much longer do we wait for the rest of Chaos to catch up while Death Guard suddenly has core units mm -hmm. and the rest of Chaos? I, I mean, that's a great question, Paul. Are they going to is Death Guard going to show us what is core for Death Guard? Or are we going to get a good idea of what core is going to look like for Chaos Space Marines at large? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, very good pickup. It's it's coming, right? But at the same time, like, we don't even know, like, if they're already talking about core to, to be the Terminators and Lich Guard and that kind of stuff, this might not really be a restriction. It might just be as simple as that yeah. picture of mm -hmm. it's not going to work on your artillery and big tanks and stuff because that's sure. not what this character's function is. But if it's got if it's got two legs, including things like dreadnoughts, maybe that's what this guy, you know, in your case, you know, red with your filthy Xenos, um, <laughs> you know, if he has eight legs, whatever, mm. <laughs> but, uh, then that's so, what that army functions like. Is there, is there a backhanded buff here to a bunch of Xenos factions? Just, just I'm throwing a bone here. Um, but is this is this a backhanded buff to Xenos factions? So let's say let's say Orc Warboss can only affect core units. He was only affecting core units anyway. Is this is this a backhanded buff? Like there's no, nothing really changed. Like well, you, you're taking a war boss to keep your orc boys in line. Your big blobs of orc boys breaking heads, but things things of that ilk. Well, even is, if is this that doesn't change any. Let's just say it just doesn't change anything. It doesn't change most things. It's it now doesn't. given them a divergent path to to make rules and things more exciting in different directions, and then not have mm -hmm. that that uh, coincidental you know incidental effect of overbalancing or overpowering one thing based off of how well they push one character or one type of character or another. Yep, that's really true. Like Pharaohs. But, yeah. Well, see, the thing is, like, it, we're at this point in the game where stuff is, doesn't need all the buffs to be killy. Like, a Thunderfire Cannon doesn't need rerolls. It already hits on twos, man. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to, if you're whinging that your Thunderfire Cannon no longer gets rerolls, I'll cry me a river. I got no time. <laughs> <laughs> I just it was, use it's it as an example. 
you know? <laughs> and I'm fishing for all kind of stuff and you're like making all kind of assumptions. Like in the picture, in the picture for the article, there are some aggressors standing there. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's just a stock pick, you know, uh, happens to be of the, of the captain or whatever. But you, you're talking about is, is it a backhanded or, a, a, or an around the corner buff for things? Aggressors are just right on the cusp of being good. And if they become one of the, let's say it's a few units, they are able to get buffs from characters. Does that make units like them better? Yeah. Well, if it, it's not getting into the, you know, pros and cons of exclusion buffs. So if, okay. You know, if you were to weigh up, oh, I can get X amount of shots out of this and many aggressors, or I could do the same thing with this and many repulses. Difference is the aggressors get buffs, the repulses don't. All of a sudden, the aggressors are better technically from like a, just a pure damage output point point of view. And yeah, you have to you have to start weighing things completely differently. It's really going to fundamentally change how we value stuff. That's what I was saying with the the tech marine before. That tech marine, if, if that remains in the new codex, and I'm assuming it will, um, is all of a sudden the best the the single single best buff you can get. Uh, for an artillery, a gun line for space marines. Um, I'm assuming oh, this is a wild assumption now, but when once we get to say admech and things like that, dominuses may not affect artillery anymore. Maybe you need a manipulus or a dedalosis to get buffs on vehicles, or vice versa, or any either of those combinations. So th- I think there's a fundamental rethink of our character usage. I do like where this sits though, coming into this edition, because we have fundamentally less characters in the game. I feel like we're going to look back at 8th edition as Hero Hammer in comparison to what we got now. Like, yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but at the, at the absolute tippy-top most, my lists have five characters. The absolute freaking most. And most likely, it's two to three on average. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know how your, your boys' lists are, are looking at the moment. But even for Guard, like, I'm looking at no more than five. I used to run pff, seven. <laughs> you know, seven was an average yeah. list. I, I actually, I used to take a lot of named characters for Blood Angels, and I, and I don't know that they're all going to make their way into the list again. Mm. Well, so we're, and what I'm saying is we're getting we're getting less characters, and now they're becoming more specialized. So I feel like I, I, I think that's good for the game. Personally, I feel like we're going to have to have more units, and we're going to have to get our units to do most of the heavy lifting again. Whereas what it was, you'd have a smash captain who was 120 points who buffed all the guys, and then when he didn't feel like buffing all the guys, he'd go and buff himself and smash something in the face with the th- thunder hammer. It was like it was almost filling too many roles. Do you know what I mean? It was too mm-hmm. much a jack of all trades. He was a master of all the trades. You know, he wasn't he wasn't half good at any of them it was just it was just great same could be said for a bunch of other things well, like, well, demon princes for... that, that's what comes exactly. to mind i mean you know yeah, they exactly. they buff themselves and that that have i mean i still think they they're good even if they don't do that but that is still that's a that's a a marked decrease in their overall power when we you know we talk about throwing them into just about anything and now they're not as good yeah if this, yeah, if this goes into effect for them yeah, yeah absolutely i mean so you know you, man adam you Ran away with it in the best Sorry. direction, I think. No, it was great. It was a great direction. That, that's, I mean, you're, you're 100% on point where I think people should really be looking at this in regards of, I, I mean, we were talking about that with uh, uh, lots of folks that it's not Hero Hammer. This, the, the Death Star, you, you just, I mean, in some cases, it's still going to be there, sure. Like some units lend themselves to that. Mm-hmm. But in reality, like I, I'm with you. I mean, my, I, I've been playing around. Uh, with my what I'm affectionately calling Iron Warrior Primaris, which huh. are, are quite heretically so, I'm using Imperial Fist traits with my Primaris Space Marines that I'm painting up as Iron Warriors. But to that point, I mean Imperial Fist. So I've been they have a benefit to to kind of compile all these hero traits onto one. So I had a I had a a company commander, a Phobos command captain who I had given the eye of hypnot so not a, well, only was he giving reroll ones to hit but reroll ones to wound mm-hmm. and then you know giving him two warlord traits and then of course I had the you know or a warlord trait and then having the master of sanctity off to the side and so I only had I mean I'm with you I only had two characters in my list so far uh, you know yeah. not a lot out there where I was trying to plus up but I I like this to an extent with the core and everything else like that because and just like the article article kind of hinted at like with trying to push the, the the heroes or the the characters into the fight a little more they you know they aren't going to benefit these bigger platforms necessarily mm. now there might be some you know exceptions here or there but your hero your character is going to want to get into the fight to one extent or another because of where that core is going to be by and large mm. and so I, I think it's great I, I i really do think that they have added in a a, a constraining factor that is adding to it's it's enriching the game and and to to play the the advocate you know to what you were saying Paul I, I totally agree that there are going to be a lot of people who don't like this and that's yeah. okay it is a, a point of change and 
I understand, you know, if you were comfortable and you had an army that has been, been doing well by you throughout all of, uh, of eighth edition, and, and now you're, you're having to adjust because they decided to change that. I, I understand your consternation. I mean, you know, you mentioned fifth edition, Adam, and that's, that's very much, I mean, we, we were playing some of this like that beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, 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 it's just a point of adaptation that, that this too shall, shall pass as we all, adapt and go forward maybe there's enough people like change just the concept of change but no one likes to be changed and, yeah, there you, you know, go. May, maybe well there's, a, there's enough things out there that you know most people are not being changed and so this it will you know we'll get through this little awkward phase but i do want to mention that martarion you were talking about death guard coming up mm. martarion one of his just most fiendish rules is he's the prime mark of the death guard you may re-roll failed hit rolls of one made for friendly Death Guard units within seven inches of Martarion. So that means he buffs himself. So when he rolls in with his mm. 70 million attacks yeah. and re-rolling ones, then hitting, I mean, that's part of what makes him just so, you know, I guess murderous is <laughs> too much on the nose. But, you know, that, that's what makes him so, one of the things that makes him so powerful. And if that no, if he no longer is able to give himself that insurance, you know, should we expect like a point decrease or power level decrease or whatever for things like Martyrian and Magnus? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I wouldn't. Mm, so here's here's something we haven't brought up yet. Uh, we have a chapter approved coming in three months. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the depth of data they're going to have to go off and the, the amount of playtesting and the amount of reps that we're going to be able to say here here's a hundred thousand games of nine for you to educate and inform your decisions but we're really going to that's i think this will be exactly what paul says like they're going to get a clean to clean slate i guess ninth edition uh with in full knowledge of their codex direction because maybe eighth maybe the last chapter approved was written with knowledge of how the psychic awakenings are going to sit uh, the the first breath into the new edition whereas we're coming in with a bit of stability but that stability isn't through reps is through just being able to see how people have evolved their thinking more than how people have evolved on the table. Well, so yeah, I mean, they've got a clear vision, what I happens. think, for this. I think there's, yeah, there's exactly. a real clear vision for this. It's going to be more. Yeah. It's going to be more informed by their vision than it is by our by our data, I guess. Yeah. And so I think that's going to give us a much a much clearer idea of how they want the game to be played, how they want things to be weighted. Um, so I think this could be the most interesting chapter approved we've had. That's a that's a that's a fair point. That's a very inter- interesting perspective on that. Yeah, I wonder if we'll see any any COVID delays or whatever. Mm, with that. That's actually true as well. Uh, yeah. But you know, still. But, but yeah, look, if Motarian does go down in points, legit, it'll it'll like we'll come back in three months and be like, Paul. Nail on the head, mate. You're exactly right. <laughs> well, I mean, it like, just lost, has to be factored some... into the, the the power level, the powerfulness of these and usefulness of these characters, because you want to see them on the tabletop. But you know, yeah. well, and, okay. and and so consider, you know, Mortarian doesn't have it, and I'm sure there's some people out there in the Death Guard realms that would argue he should. But you know, so Gilliman and I mean, I was joking around about Gilman being, you know, Gilman will be core too, you know, knowing the, the odds <laughs> of the Space Marines. Whatever, no, no. So, uh, you know, kidding, of course, but the Gilman and Abaddon, they, they both have this capability of buffing Imperium or Chaos units That's at true. large, respectively. And so, you know, are we going to see shifts to that to a certain extent? So like you said, Adam, you know, is that going to affect the, the price point? And mm. so that that'll be interesting to see with the adjustments to that as well. What other ones? So is it only is it only those two that reach across all chapters, all variants to their super factions? Celestine grants. Uh, you know, we were we when we talked about sisters previously. Mm. Uh, you know, she increases their invuln, but she actually yeah. grants other imperials an invuln. Uh, well, guard, I think, but yeah. she grants a six up invuln, and then. Uh, the custodes banners, the, yeah. the exilias, they, I know that they can be extended to Imperium units as well. Mm. And so those are, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. I, I think that there aren't very many other cross faction mixing capabilities. There might be some Eldar, maybe, maybe, uh, but I, 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 think, I think they think cleared they, up all that Eldari stuff. They did. Yeah. I think they, for good, for some good reasons. <laughs> yes. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad so about it when it happened, but yes. <laughs> so I mentioned I mentioned straight off the bat that I think this is a backhand buff to, to or could be a backhand buff to Xenos factions, um, things that don't rely on this amalgamation of buffs onto a, a single or multiple um, uh, characters to buff and, and double down on all their units. But just a crazy idea popped in my head: knights. Right now, knights are in a 
horrible place because of the state of the game and the mission structure and stuff. But they're also in a bit really bad way because they're not hard to kill anymore. They're not. They're legitimately not that hard to kill. Um, and the, the when they really first started taking hits was and GW used the diagram perfectly where the repulsor executioners came out that would wound them on a three plus and no matter what they do they're going to knock off a, a decent uh, amount of wounds. Is this a backhanded buff to them too? Like the heavy mech archetype, like sorry the the elite durability archetype lists things like yeah of the elk of knights or like the buggy even the buggy list for orcs what to say because a lot of the things that are the, the, the a lot of the best things the best most powerful potent things for knocking down armor are in your heavy support slot and presumably are not going to be core hopefully um i think the knights need to get an inch shorter or the train needs to get an inch taller <laughs> well I've, I've always thought that if you took mono knights your knights have obsec and they count as five like a little knight counts as five models big knight counts as ten models i always thought that was an easy elegant way for them to do it um and would give them legitimate agency in the game again but uh and but you have to take mono no mix and match no no loyal 32s or admec <laughs> battalions that crap if you're in for a dollar in for a dime baby um and yeah I've always thought that would be an elegant you, way for you are it. I mean you're on you're mentioning a good point though because these characters help uh, smooth out the variants of those vehicles and stuff the, the things that are good at, at taking them out uh, mm. I mean even shadow swords or whatever being buffed by you know Harker yeah next to him yeah exactly I mean, what's he doing like they can't even hear him he's outside he's like shoot harder no, what? I think Harker <laughs> should be the exception he's the one that should <laughs> <laughs> Harker should get to stand on top of the bane blade he should have this special well, rule. <laughs> you know that uh, what's his name? Yarak has the Fortress of Arrogance. You know he needs to be in there telling That's him true. to That's slick true. load those those cannons or or whatever. But no, you, you, so you, great point though about these things that you're able to really control the variants for these these powerful weapons. And if they're always doing five damage or something, then there's mm-hmm. just no prayer for a knight. But now if they're back down to doing occasionally five damage, then you know, maybe you have some less predictable turns from things that are good at taking them out and so they do get to make it to turn three turn four mm. kind of thing yeah and defensive buffs become a lot more prevalent a lot more impactful like if you've got a repulsive execution that's hitting you on threes with no re-rolls all of a sudden if you've got minus one to hit on say mortarian you know coming in they're hitting him on fours with no re-rolls crazy you get two hits instead of four which you would have gotten, you know, four hits with threes on rerolls, maybe. And then you're wounding on, on threes, no reroll ones. You got two hits, one wound. He's got a four up in vuln, 50 50 hit. Like all of a sudden, those big things seem a lot tastier because all of a sudden you might get to use them. Yeah. And when you couple that with being able to leave them off the board, maybe they're sitting in a sweet spot now when we don't just have infantry hammer. And I don't mind, I, I, and, and saying that, I prefer infantry hammer, to be honest. That's how I like and enjoy to play the game. I, I like but that's them to not both be able to exist, though. Like, exactly. Like, I want, I want, I want to, I want to, a perfect balanced, perfectly balanced world that all things should be. Thanks, Thanos. I mean, these things look so <laughs> cool. They have to be, they need to be on the table. People are compelled to try to continue to make them work on the table. Yeah. It'd be great if the table worked for them. Dead set. Remember the little start of 8th edition? Morty and Motarian were everybody. They were the, um, what were the two, the two bad boys in Mighty Ducks called? Oh, the, the Bash Brothers. Or the, Smash the, they Brothers. were the Bash Brothers. Yeah. The Bash Brothers. <laughs> oh, Smash Brothers is the video game. The Bash Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Bash Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Mighty Ducks. Um, you know, and they flew together. They both got wings, but um, yeah, they they were everywhere. And it, mind you, I didn't miss them when they were gone. I didn't miss them when people stopped playing them. I missed them when people said, "I can't play them; they're bad." Then I was like, "Oof, you shouldn't be." Out. It's a it's a freaking Primark. It's an actual legitimate Primark. You shouldn't. That should never be a thing in the game. Should never be bad. Uh, well, they I mean, should never no, be, they should, you, should, you should never be like, I regret taking them. You've you know, always, always been able to like, make a case for them. I think that the, when they actually got fell out of fashion, that was more it because some things bubbled up and were able to deal with them. And that is the ebb and flow of what the game should be. But but yeah, I, I, just, I do hope that after these changes we were talking about specifically that they are addressed. And so they them and things like the Knights, I mean, even the Castellan and the, and the Valiant and that kind of stuff, you know, they, they look neat and... Let's make, let's make sure we got space for them. It's, it's well, I mean, I think that it's kind of a there, there's always a discussion in the meta, and and you hear that hyperbole that this is you know so and so is unplayable. Bass Brothers is an unplayable combination now. Um, I I do think that there was some more weight to that in Eighth Edition previously, where you could say that with some more clarity or definition. Mm-hmm. But I think that the mission structure, and we, we, we have hinted, and we've touched on this before, I, I do think mission structure in ninth edition with, with how the primaries are set up and how some of the, the, uh, the, the secondaries are set, I do think that there's a lot more use for 
units across the board and how you apply them. I mean, there's some things that you can lean into, but I think it's really a lot more difficult to say that that oh well that unit is entirely unplayable well yeah. it, it, there's a lot more in how you use it and you can still get quite quite a bit of mileage out of, of something that that people and i understand there there are degrees of efficiency and points and whatnot and how you but i, I still think that ninth edition has opened up a lot more and it's not so much bent on you know the, the thing that that i think we and there were still people running them quite efficiently, but I think Bash Brothers got knocked out in eighth by and large by by Castellans taking a, mm. a prime seat, you know. And, and when they they stepped up with those big old cannons of theirs, I mean, it, it, you, you just like the Repulsor Executioner, I mean, the the Castellans very much had that on lock. And uh, I just don't think that they necessarily are immediately canceling each other out right now in ninth edition. Mm. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's we have a polarized anything yet, which I love. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. I, see this, I think these these changes are a positive thing. I think it gives them some, uh, you know, again, shows us, you know, kind of what to expect for for things to come, and gives mm. them some some trails to to follow out and explore in different ways to give us, you know, cool more variants in the game. Mm. Can I can I just a uh, message for G Dub? Yeah. <laughs> Stop making marines. Just just stop for six months. Just let's, can we go six months without a marine release? Didn't after you, this? you you saw the little video, right? <laughs> I did. Uh, <laughs> nope. I mean, call says no. Hit the Not button right. again. Don't More primaries. <laughs> that is oh, that was hilarious. I love it when you they can you can look at yourself, you know, and, and yeah. see what yeah. what's there. Well, guys, let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back. We're actually going to talk uh, briefly about the Nova Open Charitable Foundation. Uh, we got to participate in this last weekend. Pretty awesome. Be back in just a second. See you then. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey everybody, we are back. Still got Red and Adam here. Hello. Hey. Red and Adam. So this this past weekend, we participated with the Nova Open Charitable Foundation Virtual Lounge. Yeah, an amazing opportunity uh, came our way, and, and Paul hit me up and asked asked us to be in, if I was willing to be involved. And I mean, how could I say no? Like, really? Yeah, but I don't think we knew what to expect. This is the first year they've done this virtual element to it. So at the Nova Open tournament that you know has been that was canceled because of you know the conditions of where where everything is in the world right now. Uh, they a big part of their their fundraiser, their raffle ticket purchases, and and people donating uh, was from the lounge that they would have on site. And when they weren't able to do that, they you know, asked if we would we would assist with getting you know getting some attention and running this facilitating part of this uh, on that weekend that day that three three and a half hours. So we streamed live. Um, Adam and I were on the camera. Uh, Josh Diffie was behind the scenes and Reg, you were in the, the chat on Twitch with us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we streamed for three and a half hours or so. And, you know, it was really great to see the outpouring of support in that people tuning in and then people buying raffle tickets, you know, mm-hmm. for charity, but with the, you know, with the upside of, of maybe coming away with a cool model or, or a unit or army or whatever. Yeah. Uh, there was a man. That wasn't something like everything I saw there was worth putting a raffle ticket on. Like there was nothing else. Like I would regret owning it. You know. Yeah. They really. They not only do they put a, a top shelf uh, organize, you know, organization together, top shelf charity together for a lot of great purposes, but they give away some top shelf stuff. It's not like you're, you're bidding on some gray plastic, some YouTube propane, YouTube propane, sorry, what, eBay propane, sorry, <laughs> some eBay propane, propane crap. You're bidding on some professional ridiculously high quality stuff all proceeds for charity are phenomenal yeah so just really happy to to be a part of that and they were i mean the, the artist who gave their time the models mm-hmm. and stuff like all that stuff was there like people you know wanted to be a part of of helping these charities and yeah yeah it was again just, it was just fun to be a part of it in some way and thanks for everybody who who tuned in and came out and you know watch for more stuff i, I think if they do something like that again, maybe we'll do it too. And you know, it was real fun. One of my best, one of the best experiences I've had in the hobby. <laughs> I participated in, in one of their rituals of of tiny beer mugs. <laughs> you did. That was hilarious. So I ordered. I don't know. I felt like I or I ordered a, a fair amount, and I made up a bunch of little tiny beers just as we got as we were starting to wind up the stream or whatever. And now they're like gremlins. Everywhere I look, I find one or two of these little beer mugs. <laughs> I guess I. I don't know. 
<laughs> I, uh, neat experience. I actually, you know, the, watching the stream and everything, I mean, they had the lounge crew on there, and uh, I couldn't pass up. I, I tried out the, uh, they they gave instructions on how to make different drinks, and so I uh, I took their, their word for it and made one of their old fashions. It was pretty good. I enjoyed it quite yes. a bit. So th- that then, team, yeah, they, they had not done that kind of stuff. This video stuff is, you know, this internet stuff before, and they really dug in and embraced it and took a hold of it. And it, it was a really cool team atmosphere and, and mentality. I love that kind of stuff. It was just really cool to see it all come together. Me too. It was crazy good. Uh, they, they were phenomenal. Those, the ladies. Yeah. They, you would, you wouldn't be able to tell they haven't done this every year for the last like 10 years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So fun. So again, yeah, just watch this space as far as that's concerned, but uh, yeah, again, it's it incredibly rewarding for us, just uh, like on a personal level, being able to support those charities. And then, and then, you know, I, for, you know, talking 40 K and for a good cause, even better. Exactly right. All right. So I know we talked about the, the core 40 K being a rock to the core, of <laughs> but, and it led to an interesting discussion. I think that part of it is, you know, we, it's some of the things are going to be the same for some people and it's going to be different for some others. And yeah, you know, I, I think I'm encouraged to see where this edition is going. Yeah, to me too. Um, I was really excited for eighth edition, but as soon as I got, I think as soon as I got the the indexes, I got all the indexes and looked through all of them. I think a little bit of the shine came off for me, and then it, it kind of came back over time until I feel like there's this massive crescendo of the perfectly balanced or near perfectly balanced game. Just after the Castellan died, we had like six months of majestic gameplay where every army had a had a good rule set had a couple of really good plays they could all win it on the day and then marines came out and just completely screwed the pooch so <laughs> 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 and then well, the shine the luster came off again and, and you know so there's something and I, I don't mean to pick too much at the scab here but you know they told us in certain regards when going into eighth that seventh edition at the tail end of seventh edition we had there were a ton of books there was a ton of material and mm-hmm. i think we kind of, and, and whether it was, was stated or not, we kind of thought 8th edition was going to be different in regards that there wasn't going to be a massive bloat necessarily attached to it. And to, to say that it's just not correct, there was bloat and it continued mm. and there there was a lot of, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the material. I loved reading the Vigilist campaigns. I loved I loved the direction of Psychic Awakening. It was all awesome, great buildup, a lot of lore attached, and then a lot of rules, though, right? But I will say, with the way Ninth has kicked off, I, I think that the model of the game and the setup and everything, as as I, Adam, I, I couldn't let you go without this. Uh, yeah. There is this app that they are oh. constantly updating the material on, and that the bloat is consolidated <laughs> into this one tool that if you just subscribe, you can actually access that information. Now, of course, with the new deal, you know, you're going to have to buy the Space Marine Codex. You're going to have to buy the, <laughs> the Necron Codex. But I'm telling you, it's like it's they've consolidated all the rules in it. I can easily search through everything that currently exists in the rules is in there right now as it is. And I, I'm just saying it, it's it's very convenient. It's very cool. And it's it's worked very well for me. Um, I was I, I would highly recommend there today. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd recommend it to anybody who doesn't have it. There, Sorry, mate. I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are getting so much mileage. That was so good. Uh, was for awesome. order, changing gears just a little bit up for order right now is the special Catachin model, Ripper Jackson. Oh, man. Vasquez. Yeah, and they got me thinking is like, what other 80s heroes can they bring into this i mean i know i mean there's there's plenty right i mean there but a lot of them are are arnie or or sly which we've got as as marbo uh and then vasquez but you know a ripley a chuck norris you know yeah yeah we don't have a norris we technically don't have a a john claude van damme and what i really want is i want a hudson i want a what's what's his name from everything (sighs) ah bill paxton i want a bill paxton like (laughs) commissar yeah well, I was Who's, thinking, uh, <laughs> was it Van Damme? Is did he play Bison one time? No, he was Guy. He was yeah, he was Guy. Street Fighter. Who wants to go home? Who wants to go with me? Yeah, so good. Was he Guy? <laughs> Terrible movie. I love it. He was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's there's plenty of me left on that bone, and and I don't mind if they did every single one of them. Like that's oh, they they should absolutely. Yeah, it's more of an homage than anything, if you ask me, and I will gladly field them all. We do need a we need a Ripley like in a in a Sentinel or something. 
Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes, we do. Yeah. That is exactly what we need. A special character, Sentinel mm. pilot. Too heavy, too heavy flamers or something. And the close combat weapons, the loader. Yeah, yeah, the loaders. The forge loaders, which are now apparently, I think they're out of production. Well, yeah. it can be this perfect way to transition to plastic. And yeah. It's like a there dual you kit. You have your generic, you know, <laughs> Bane Blade loader, and then you've got Ripley, the mm. the Broodlord killer, the Swarm Lord killer. <laughs> the, yeah, the Hive Tyrant, thrower adder of airlocks. <laughs> <laughs> and then we need an airlock. We do. We need an airlock. <laughs> I love where this is going. Special mission. Oh, yeah. This is why. Why isn't this not a mini game already? <laughs> it it's, could it's, be. No, it's an add-on to Next Wonder. No, it's a special level of Blackstone Fortress. There you go. There you go. Oh, bam! Perfect. Next chapter. Yeah. Is a, I'll, I'll take. My, I'll take my check in the mail. G Dub. There you go. But, but anyway, <laughs> they could do them all, and again, I would gladly field them, and it's nothing but nostalgia and and love it. I mean, look. The, they're not a one to one, you know, which obviously, so there's still some, so people don't have to, you know, they don't have to like the movies to get the characters, but I don't mm. know, man. I could, I would gladly fill up the guard regiments, Katachin specifically, with all these cool action stars. Yeah, me too. Give them to me. Can I, I want to jump to a hobby segment. I've, uh, I've, I think I've hit another level and I want to talk about it just a little bit. But Let's I'll, do it. Yeah, I want to talk about repairing decals. <laughs> So my decal work has been, it's gotten stronger, actually. I actually feel over the weekend, I, or it might have been the last couple of days, I posted a picture on Twitter because, like, I don't, Red, I don't know about you, but do you have anxiety when you go to seal a model? Uh, Uh, Like it may cloud up or some detail is going to get obscured or whatever. It's a significant emotional event for me. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I've got, I've got these models done and I don't like the different finishes that that are on the model because some of the paints have different finishes than some of the other paints. And when you're looking at it in the light, it just, it just kind of gives you a, a weird look. It doesn't look as good as if it were all the same finish or, or when your finishes are accidental, like sometimes the gems or the eye lenses or something could be shiny, but when the 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 knee pad is shiny and the rest of it isn't then maybe that's not what you want or it creates this weird trick with your eyes to where things it doesn't look as cool as it can be yep and i went out and and sealed these models and it just went on flawless in in my opinion you know but it it really brought everything together and the models look really cool didn't obscure the edge highlights and it just really loved it it did i had this and i didn't notice it till after i posted the picture but when I put the sealer coat on there, you then noticed that the paint on the, like a dagger, like one of the little emblem daggers or whatever mm-hmm. on this guy's belt wasn't all the way coated. Like I had a little bit of the red showing through. And when I guess when the reflection of that metallic paint wasn't bounced around my eyeballs, I was then able to see it mm. you know, because I put the sealer on there. So I touched it up. That was good. But so it, that's, leave me on my next point. Decals that when, you know, I use my decal regimen is putting a, uh, like a satin coat or whatever where it go, is going to go and then putting the decal on top of it and then using Microsol or Solvacet is what I use on top of that decal to really blend it into the model and the edges of it kind of fade away and you get it. To me, it looks a little bit more of a, of a seamless surface after mm-hmm. you do that. Well, that's another reason to then go back and do it because it has a different finish than even the paints and everything else. So it leads into the sealer stuff. But putting on the yellow decals for the sergeant, for the shoulder pad, for the chapter markings, I tore both of them, the two sergeants I was putting on it, and one of the little wing bits separated on both of the decals. I'm going to pretend mm. it's, a de- it's a defect in the decal and not my ham-handedness. <laughs> Probably ham-handedness. <laughs> But I discovered that that yellow of the decal is almost a perfect match to Flash Gets Yellow. Mm. And so you can use just a little bit of Flash Gets Yellow and go in and repair the decal. And then once you put that even coat of sealer on top of it again, it's all relates back, you don't even notice the paint. Well, I'm, I'm glad you figured this out versus me because I'm not sure, as you know, we're talking about anxiety with this kind of stuff. I, I mean, I have a hard enough time with sealing, much less doing decals. So the decals, I mean, I mean, of course, years of of kind of messing around with it, and having different levels of success. But with yeah, I don't dunk the decals in water anymore. I put a little water. I clip the decal out and then put a little water on the decal, move it in place 
with a with a brush. There's like a here's where it gets super tricky, and I don't want to add to your anxiety. You need just the right amount of water on the model itself mm-hmm. to where the decal will set, and you have enough time to play with it before it starts to grip onto the surface of the model. And then once you get it in the right place, you need a little bit of a steady hand to be able to absorb some of that water off with a paintbrush without moving the decal you just put on and put in the right spot. Mm. Are you starting to get the sweat yet? I mean, just thinking about it kind of makes me nervous, but I, I think I'm, <laughs> I, I think I can hang. I think I can continue to hang. And then once the water starts to evaporate off of the, you know, it starts to where you don't, it's not liquid anymore. That's when I've been coming back with the solve set because the the, mm. the decal is already gripped to the model and you're you're less of a risk of moving the model out of the play out of place or start moving the decal out of place when you're coming back with the solve set. Okay. And that solve set then begins to dissolve the parts of the decal that you don't want and so that's when you especially don't want to be moving it around a lot because then you could, you could tear it even faster. But painting over the decals like you could use the decals just as this almost like a stencil, a pattern to paint over, depending on how you you want it to look in the end. Mm. Yeah, so this is where like I, I feel like I really need to have like I, I would not practice this necessarily on the unit that I think I would I would settle on. I, I would have to to find some got some some model that I, I'd be willing to probably a series of models that I would like to practice this on so that I make sure I get it right just so that you, know, you go back to the, the decals and getting it set and whatnot. Because once that, once I, I'm pretty sure once I put it on a model and I realized that I set the decal and it wasn't straight or something like that, I, I would I would be kicking myself for a that's, while after that. That's an excellent point. I've, uh, I've learned to um, set up what like my guide points on the model are before I start moving around the decal. Mm-hmm. Like Space Marines, the, the Outriders specifically, they have these the shoulder pads are are pretty chunky and then in the direct center of the shoulder pad they've got like a little nub that extends out over their their arm or the the forearm part Mm. that's directly in the center of the shoulder pad so if you get your chapter like i i have the benefit of having this blood drop that hangs down under the wings but it gives me a direct center line so if i line the Mm. blood drop up with the little nub on the shoulder i'm gonna have a straight decal that's a good point i'll have to figure out you know so like i said with this these iron warriors and everything i've I've gotten a little with some practice i'm getting better at because i'm painting you know hazard stripes and chevrons and whatnot and i kind of do the same thing so i'll have to make sure i'm paying attention to that to kind of set up similar reference points when i get to decals like guard tanks have all the rivets and things like that Mm -hmm. exactly you you, you just use them as your your reference points for a lot i guess like you're tracking the stars when you're traveling by boat or something no, no, sure. I mean, it's absolutely. I've been doing these chevrons. It's kind of the same deal. Like whether it's the rivets off of the armor piece or something like that, for sure. Very much so. That's a good tip. When you're painting the chevrons, do you paint on the light color first, or do you go for the the black first? So I am fortunate in that you know we talked about the other time previously about some of these recovery you know projects that that you pick up, whether it's you know secondhand or whether you want to call it a garage sale or something like that. I was fortunate where I was able to pick up from actually a good friend, several of his, and he was playing Scythes of the Emperor, right? So that was like a black and yellow paint Mm -hmm. scheme. And so I've really just taken advantage of that where the yellow has already been present. And then that's where I go over and do black. And, you know, we've talked about painting lighter colors or yellows before, you know, colors to that effect. And I think it's much harder to do the yellows over the black versus like doing the lighter color and then painting the black over that. I, I would much rather have a, a lighter color underneath. And then uh, so I, I have very thin tape here that I use. And I've even I, I take that and I even cut that in half. And then I put those over it and then I just paint the black on. And that's that's and then I can go back and actually blend in the yellow once I have the black down so I can see where the you know the zones are or whatnot. So. That's some tedious work right there. That's that's something I struggle with. I struggle with masking in general. I'm not I don't seem to I either mess up the mask or my my paint blend bleeds over or when it doesn't bleed over the tape pulls up some of the paint below it. Mm-hmm. Like I just don't yeah. I don't I can't seem to find that that mix on how to do that. Like the right pressure or what to, you know how how to get that that working for me. It's just not good at that. Yeah, and and to be fair, I mean I I what I 
I put the I use the tape and then the I don't leave the tape on there for a significant amount of time. Uh, mainly, you know, you get concerned about it pulling paint off or whatnot. Um, but also, uh, I would rather pull the paint off, pull, pull the tape off, and then go in there and I can correct myself in painting. You know, using very fine paint brushes or whatnot, or even pens. Some pen, you know, paint pens with black really helps reestablish those lines sometimes with a, a, a I have a, a nice flexible very thin ruler that I'll use and that can can help me redefine oh, nice. those straight straight lines for the black too. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's, that's a really good tip. I know we're kind of meandering around with the with the hobby stuff here, but I also sure. painted one of the the greatest faces that I have personally ever painted to the to the point where I felt confident enough to to post like a close up on on Twitter. And the the reason I'm even more proud of the accomplishment is because when I, I this is the second go at this one at the same face that I had and the first time that um, I painted it he he did he looked like Leatherface <laughs> from from Chainsaw Massacre I mean it looked it looked terrible uh, but I went in and I used I, by the time that I was done trying to highlight the original face I'd pretty much painted over his entire face with a much lighter color. So then I thought, let me just go in and instead of using like Reichlin Flesh Shade or one of those things, let me go in and use a thinned down uh, Gilliman Flesh. Now, Gilliman Flesh, like it works right out of the pot over Wraithbone or something, you know, like a light mm-hmm. color. It just, and it, and it, it, it's one of those, it, like it, it's Nuln Oil, Athonian Camo Shade, Agrax Earth Shade, and Gilliman Flesh. It's, it's in that ranking. But what we're seeing is, is, is people's, mature with their use of contrast paints it doesn't need to be or doesn't have to be used just as a one thick coat type of application and Mm -hmm. i used it like i was i didn't shade all over shade i just used it to try to get right in the recesses and it hung there it did what it was it did that Uh, and when that all dried i was able to go in and pick out some of the features of the face and i didn't obscure it you know, with another big thick coat of paint because I had already messed it up once and I was worried about <laughs> losing all the detail. But what that Gillum of Flesh did is it it went in there and actually helped define some of the features so I could help go and and find them with my... Look, I broke out the big guns, man. I went with the extra small artificer brush. Oh, wow. And was, was that like a couple fun. hairs, a couple threads? Uh, it's, I mean, it's not that tiny. It's not. I don't know what the tiniest to tiny brush is. It's the smallest one and the and the the highest quality slash smallest one that GW offers. Sure, but I've actually found they're kind of expensive. But uh, but I've gotten some. I feel like I've gotten value out of these brushes. Mm. I got them on a whim and then didn't use them for a long time. And then one of my good buddies like just said, "What are you waiting on?" You know, I was like, "You you never know. You know, you could always find an excuse not to use the cool thing that you've got, but play with it. You know, it's it's like a toilet like anything else." And I've enjoyed using them, but uh, but I try to reserve it for. Like, I'm kind of like, I still don't use it for metallic paints. You know, whatever. I try to reserve it for sure. when I think I really need it. And I went in there and I like, I did this guy's teeth and I did his eyes, you know. And anyway, I'm pretty pleased with it. And But it was it was a recovery of a mistake. And I think that's what makes it even more satisfying. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I mean, I saw it. I, I think it's great, especially, like you said, you know, on a close-up kind of deal. I mean, my, my face is, and I, I do love Gilliman flesh. I think that that's a great material um how however they they got to crafting it i I think it's really good for for flesh and uh but what you were able to do at a close-up like that man i I mean kudos to you i'm I'm definitely not there by any means i I appreciate my you know minimum foot distance from my models (laughs) yeah the the close-up so yeah i mean all you just got to be pleased with it that's it man but i'm using i think i rely more on products than talent Mm. And, you know, maybe that's one of the way, we, you know, one of the things we talk about is just finding the right mix for you. You know, like this, you're, you're going to see artists out there and t- people doing tutorials that do it their way. You know, you, that may work for you, but fi- you may need a blend of different people's stuff. And so anyway, so I try to be as explicit as I can about the results that I'm pleased with about what I'm doing. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, Red, uh, I know we kind of you again did a little bit of a sprint around the hobby thing, but how's your Tanith coming? Man, so the Tanith are pretty good i have some cloaks that i've got some third-party cloaks that are going on to some old guard that i have finally gotten primed in i have well over 60 
uh, old Necromunda and actual Tanith models that are base painted. I have uh, a good friend of mine is supplying me with uh, some bases that he has. And so I'm waiting for those to come in. And then I'm going to get these guys based and they're going to continue progress. I've got most of the vehicles set up. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, vehicle wise, uh, I'll admit. So I've also, you know, maintaining your tools and everything. I've, I've got my airbrush that I'm working on. I just ordered some small replacement parts. The, you know, the needle, if you're not careful mm-hmm. with that, um, I got to admit and moving around probably just out of some clumsiness on my part i moved around and i i can tell you right now just from looking at it that the needle is affected and so i am i've got a replacement needle coming in i mean it's a you know it's i've got an iwata eclipse uh cs it's a great little airbrush that i have it just needs some some parts and it's it's not something that you necessarily need to go out and buy a whole new airbrush or anything i just order a new needle and i've got to get a actually a new uh needle cap and then it'll be ready to go. And so I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm making some pretty good progress. Okay, I can't wait to see more of it. Well, uh, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. I don't say that often enough, but I'm trying. I'm trying <laughs> to be better about it. <laughs> you got anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Well, that's. I appreciate everybody tuning in, and uh, thanks to those that that tuned into the the Nova Foundation deal. It was really awesome. Glad I got to be part of it. Well, it was. Uh, in the chat, I really enjoyed talking to some of those folks, but I do really do appreciate you listening and uh, look forward to, to talking to you next time, Paul. Heck yeah, Adam had to drop, but he will be back. We'll all be back next week. Uh, we'll see you then. Take care. my day.